time here and I hope that you will have a good time here. My name is Lina Rumsteinbander, for those of you who haven't met me in Sydney. And uh, the two coming weeks will be run from here. So this is your lecture room where you will be. We have a lot of plugs around in this building and the building next door. And we will be showing you around those labs and then there will be labs in chemistry that we will be showing you as well. But first thing first, so today's lecture is not exactly within the workshop on uh, um, uh, organic photovoltaics, but it's a lecture by Dr. Warwick Bowen, who will be talking to you about whispering gallery mode optical microresonators. And it's an activity that, uh, a research area that we have started a few years ago when Warwick arrived here from New Zealand. And the lab is in full go and it's having fantastic results. And uh, uh, Friday week, we'll be taking you around the labs and you'll be able to see this micro resonators in action and see how they look and what they do and what results the lab has achieved up to now. Uh, so, Warren, welcome, and uh, please, we'll start in a minute. However, before that, I would like to introduce Susan Grantham, who is our local um, uh, organizer of this uh, ICAM, and she is your source of knowledge about everything around the university and the Women's College in Brisbane and the rest of it. Uh, she's the person who prepared uh, your uh, booklets and all the information that you will need around the campus. Uh, and now she has a few things to tell you. Before she does that, I would also like to introduce Ian Mortimer, who is our guru in IT, and he'll be trying to fix you up with some sort of connection to internet, most probably cable, and then he can tell you how to go about to get wireless connection, but we, we might wait with that for a little just first things first, if fire alarms go off, if you can just make your way out through these doors and out into the Great Court. Um, so they will, it starts with an alarm that says that they have been activated, please wait for the next message. You'll eventually get told, now's the time to evacuate. So if you can just make your way straight out through those doors, straight ahead through the next set of doors and out into the Great Court. Toilets uh, can be found if you head down this hallway and around the corner. They're on the far side of the building, both ladies and gents' toilets. Um, name badges. At the, during this week and next week, there are various groups meeting here. So can you please make sure you wear your name badges at all times? It's the only way we're going to know from the morning and afternoon tea times and who's in which group. So there's going to be people floating around the place all over. Um, morning and afternoon teas. If you head down the hallway this way, just before you go through the um, corridor that takes you into the next building, the tea room is there, so you'll get your morning and afternoon teas there. Those that are staying at the Women's College, that your packed lunch will be arriving in time for lunchtime. From tomorrow onwards, you pick it up from the Women's College before you come up here. Okay, but just for this day, they're going to deliver them all up here. All right, so once again, you'll need your name badges to pick them up. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much for that. And Ian, any information about IT at the moment, or we wait to see what happens? <laughs> no, I'm going to ask questions, but yeah, but 
But for me, it's been particularly interesting because uh, I, I've lived in the US, New Zealand, I'm from New Zealand, and Australia. My wife is from Korea and has lived in Japan. So that means there were six teams in the World Cup that we were representing, including North Korea, uh, which has never happened before and is just absolutely crazy. So now there are two in Japan and Korea. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Oh, I'm going to have to apologize first. My computer video is playing up. I'm going to transfer the presentation onto a memory stick and go from there, I think. The other thing I have to thank ICAM for is for being accommodating. I'm, I'm uh, flying to Japan tomorrow, so, uh, so they had to put me on it, which is why I'm in the conversation. Okay, so uh, what I want to talk to you about these four lectures is what's been going on with micro resonators. I hope at the end of it you'll have an idea of what these things are and what they're useful for, and also what fun and science you can do with them. Um, <coughs> The first lecture is just giving background, so why would we care about micro resonators, why would we care about ultra high Q resonators. Uh, <coughs> and then I'm going to go on to. Oh, okay, so I should acknowledge some sources. I've drawn quite heavily, especially in this first lecture, lecture from Nick Optics and from a couple of very nice Caltech PhDs, uh, Joe Buck from the Kimball Group. Um, uh, and, and the PhD thesis uh, is by Tim from the Mahala group at Caltech. There's this very nice PRL which has supplementary information. I didn't realize you could have that PRL until recently, uh, which goes through some of the very, very young. All right, so, so there are four lectures. The first one now is background. The second one's going to be on uh, applications of this from going mode resonators to particle sensing. I was going to initially I was planning to, 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 to look at two different types of sensing, mass sensing uh, and evanescent field sensing, but I don't really have space, so I've, I've dropped the mass sensing. I'm just going to talk about the evanescent field sensing. And if you're interested in that, you can talk about it some other time. Uh, the third lecture is on chemical dynamics. So this is uh, quantum interaction between single atoms or, or uh, artificial atoms and modes of optical cavities. And the fourth is on optical cavities. All right, so this lecture, uh, basically, you know, why, why would we want a small cavity? Why would we want a IQ cavity? What kind of whispering gallery mode cavity? Well, how do, how, does, how do whispering gallery mode cavities give us this? What type of whispering gallery mode cavities are there? And, and, and what are the sort of technical considerations? How do you couple with these cavities? How do you get light into them? Uh, and what kind of loss mechanisms are there? And of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about applications. So whenever you talk about optical resonators, you really have to start with the basic. I apologize if this is going very slow for you guys. 
but you start with this basic two, two mirror fabric progress data, right? So two mirrors reflected in these input light, you get some, some resonance and you get some output light. And it's rather counterintuitive when you first see this that if you get the impedance matching right, which basically means you need to get these two reflectivities the same, then all the light will go through and you get a very large buildup of, 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 of electric field and the limit that reflectivity is in these two mirrors goes to one. In other words, that they reflect almost all, all the light that comes off, goes off them. <coughs> so, so this enhanced electric field you're getting here is really the basis for most applications of optical resonators with the exception of, uh, of filtering, I guess. Um, okay, so we just did a little bit of very basic maths. We can see why this works. So if we visit the electric field inside the cavity, it just equals the electric field goes through the mirror in its zeroth pass, if you like, which is just the transmission of the first mirror times the input electric field plus the electric field, that electric field after it cycles around one cycle. So here we get an extra two reflections of mirrors, so we get some attenuation. The, the electric field itself and a phase shift, which is just equal to the wave, the wave vector k, or the wave number k, times, times twice the length of the cavity, because the light goes twice on the cavity, get back, plus further terms an increasing and increasing attenuation. You can write this as a geometric sum, and obviously you can solve it uh, just <laughs> very, very straightforwardly to get the electric field inside the cavity. All right. So we have the electric field inside the cavity. Oh, so, so the point is, the point here is that if you can get this term here to be real, right? So, so the 2i kl to equal some integer number of 2 pi, then 1 minus that is going to be something small, and therefore you can get you can get an enhancement of your electric field. And further, if you can get R in and R out close to 1, then 1 minus 1 is a very small number, and you get a large enhancement. So if you look at, if you look at this sum, we can just do, do, a, do this on a phase diagram. The, the angle here is due to the phase shift on cycling through the cavity, and you can see that, that if I can get the phase shift to zero, then I can get a large intracapitalic field, otherwise it sort of averages out to maybe zero or something small. So let's think about the on-resonance case. So the on-resonance case, that was when that, that uh, term in the exponential equal 2 pi, that could be just written very simply as k, k times the length, the wave, wave number times the length, equals some integer number pi, times pi. <coughs> the, the, wave, the wave number is just 2 pi on lambda, or omega on c, so we plug that in, we get a, a criterion for the frequencies which resonate inside this cavity. Right? Uh, and, and then we can define some useful parameters. The first is we can define the free spectral range. So this is the spacing between two modes within the cavity. All right, so if we go from m to m plus 1, then I have a frequency shift to c pi on l. The second is the finesse of the cavity. So the finesse is really useful because it's something we can measure. Right? It's very hard to measure the reflectivities of mirrors in the lab, believe me much easier to measure the finesse because if you scan, say, the wavelength or length of your cavity, you get a spectrum. This is when you're on resonance, this is when you're off resonance, and if you take the ratio of, of, of the width of one of the resonances to the distance between them to the free spectral range, then you get the finesse. Okay, so let's, okay. So let's consider the on resonance case. Did I say that for uh, where are we? So yeah, so let's consider the on resonance case and just take the two reflectivities to be equal. That turns out to be the, the criterion you want if you want to enhance the electric field inside the cavity, because this is the impedance matching condition. It turns out that you get all the light going through the cavity and you're to go through it's gonna it's gonna build up inside. <coughs> Then, then, if, then if we write this electric field out, we get a very simple criterion, a very simple expression. It's just, ultimately, it's just equal to the input electric field divided by square, square root of the transmission of, of those two mirrors. So if you make the transmission go to zero, in other words, the reflection go to, go to one, 
then you can make the electric field arbitrary lot, arbitrarily large, which is really what we care about. <coughs> okay. So, so then, so then we can we can always rewrite this in terms of the nets. I, I guess I don't derive this here, but the finesse is just approximately pi on t for a high Q cavity. So I can substitute that in with the electric field enhancement as a function of finesse. So you can see that if I double the finesse, then the electric field inside the cavity goes up by root 2. <coughs> okay. So so I've said this a couple times, but here are, here are some areas where this, where this electric field enhancement is important. In sensing, if you have a, a biomolecule, you put that inside the cavity, then it interacts via the electric field with the light inside the cavity. So if I, if I increase the electric field, I increase the interaction so I, I can sense that molecule better. We'll see that in more detail later. In optomechanics, mechanics, if I have more light inside the cavity, I have more radiation pressure. If I have more radiation pressure, and I have more momentum kicks on the mirrors of the cavities, which is where the mechanics comes in, and, and, and I can I, I have a stronger interaction between the vibrations of mirrors and, and, and the electric field of the cavity, and the optical field of the cavity. In nonlinear optics, you want to take, for example, two photons at one frequency and combine them into one photon of twice the energy, twice the, at, 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 at twice the frequency. <coughs> To do that, you need to have a high intensity inside the cavity. You get a high probability that there are two photons there to combine. So, so, so nonlinear optics, this sort of intensity is critical. And in quantum optics, it turns out that as you as you increase the electric field intensity inside the cavity, you increase your interaction rates. So you can get a single atom or a quantum dot or an epicenter or whatever it might be, interacting more strongly with the cavity mode uh, than was possible without the enhancement. Okay, so the exception here is, is, is in photonics. In photonics, I'm not sure. I, I think it, it's, it's not the electric field enhancement that's typically important. It's more the filtering characteristics. So you want to be able to take one wavelength of light and make sure that it's transmitted or reflected, another wavelength is reflected or transmitted. So you combine two wavelengths or route them in different directions. An add drop filter or something like this. Uh, okay. So, so the question here is, or an obvious question is, well, this enhancement doesn't depend on the length of the cavity, right? It only depends on the finesse of the cavity. So why would we want to make why would we want to have a micro cavity? Right? This is the, the question I really want to answer clearly in the first part of this lecture. So uh, so it turns out that in monolithic cavities, in whispering gallery mode cavities, the finesse does depend on the album. I'll show you why in the next couple of slides. And, and so you get the volume in there. And also in quantum, in quantum experiments in particular, <coughs> you care about the enhancement of the electric field of a single photon. That's what you really care about. So if a single photon is in a large volume, its electric field is low. If you squeeze the volume down, you, you increase its electric field. So, so you really, it's, in quantum, quantum optics, it's clear that you really want a small mode volume. Okay, so this is my model of a monolithic resonator. Right? What I've done is I've replaced that out the mirror with some loss throughout the resonator. Now eventually this can become a whispering gallery mode resonator where, where you know you have a fiber coupling light in, and the only way the light can get out is by being by being either going out through the fiber, which means reflected off here, or getting absorbed or scattered in the medium. So now the losses aren't due to this mirror. There are an absorption per meter, right? Or scattering per meter, some sort of per meter loss. <coughs> so, so the intensity is dropping per meter, where alpha here is the absorption coefficient. And I apologize for later on, I use alpha as, as the polarizability of the molecule. Um, you just have to actually remember that different. That's not this lecture, that's next, the next lecture. So, if we take the, the high, if we assume we're, we're dealing with a high finesse cavity, then that means that the round trip loss is pretty small, and you can tailor or expand this exponential into just its, 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 its zero from the first order terms, right? <laughs> and we get a pretty simple expression relating that, that alpha with something equivalent to that R out that I had before. So this is 
how, how, much, how much of the light is, is still there after all the absorption going around the cavity and back here. <coughs> Now, if I again take this Higgs matching condition, where, where R equals R out equals R, uh, then, then the T that I had in my previous expression for the, for the finesse, here, the T is just, is just 1 minus R, which is 1 minus this, which is just 2 al alpha, right? So I can write the finesse in terms of an absorption. Coefficient. So now what you see is the finesse depends on the length of the cavity. All right? And also on the absorption, obviously. So if I have a smaller resonator, I can increase the finesse because there's less loss per cycle. So this is this is at least this is the one, one place where the volume comes in, not least the length. Um, I thought this was an important thing to 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 to, to, to talk about because uh, at least I came from this sort of free space optics background, and the obvious question, the question people always ask is, don't you want to make the cavities large? Can you make them large and you make the line look small? Right? That's good for filtering. You, you don't increase the electric field enhancement, you don't decrease it either, and you've got a larger area for detection. So, so that, that's true in the case where the loss is mainly from the mirrors. It's not true in the case where the loss is mainly from from, from absorption inside the cavity or per meter sort of loss. In that case, in that case it turns out, so, okay, so we all, we all know about finesse, right? Finesse is the way you characterize optical, optical cavities. The reason we use finesse is that if you change the length of the cavity, the finesse, is in, the finesse doesn't change. But here, right, so it's a parameter of the system which is independent of geometry somehow. Here it becomes dependent on geometry, and that's why we use Q instead of finesse. It turns out that Q is independent of geometry uh, for my lipid cavities. Okay, so, so let's talk about the Q. The quality factor is, is the easiest way to understand this is you have a cantilever, right? You ring it, it rings, and it decays. The Q is the number of cycles before it decays to about 50% of its initial excitation. Right, that's what the Q is, and that's, and that's essentially what we're writing here. The frequency times the decay time of the cavity. Um, I don't know why that arrow is up there, that's kind of worrying. Maybe it's PowerPoint complex. Anyway, so, so this decay time is just, it's, it's basically proportional to the decay length, which is, which is just 1 on 2 alpha. Or it's equal to the decay length divided by the speed of light, right? <coughs> and so if I substitute that in, I get the Q, which is equal to K, the wave number, divided by 2 times the absorption coefficient. <coughs> if I compare that to finesse, they look very similar. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Similar except except that there's an L in the finesse and not a Q. So I can write the finesse in terms of in terms of the Q of the cavity and, and get the electric field in terms of the Q, right? The electric field just equals Q divided by L K the N. And oh the main point here is that the Q is independent of length, right? The, the finesse depends on length. So the Q is a nicer parameter for monolithic cavities than, 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 than finesse. You have two independent parameters, the mode volume, the length, and the Q. Okay, the mode volume of, of a cavity, you can define in this sort of slightly peculiar way, I guess. Uh, it's hard to define a mode volume, right? Because you've got some mode. Where do you cut it off? It's got, if it's a Gaussian unit, it's got an exponential decay, you cut it off. You know, at what point is, is it not part of the mode anymore? Right? So the way the mode volume is defined, is just, let me see what I can do here. So let's just write this out. We've got V equals one to V squared to V divided by one to V squared, 
right? So that's how I defined it. Now you can see why I defined it that way by considering uh, a non-physical mode, right? But just a mode which is a, a square in all three dimensions, right? So this is the electric field. That's zero. This is uh, that's e max. That's e, right? Then this is x or y or z. Then then the mode volume equals the integral from, I don't know, let's just say that's zero and that's uh, L, to be kind of consistent. From zero to L, for all three, all three dimensions of log e max squared dx dy dz divided by log e max squared this is just a constant, so you can bring it out of the integral, then you've just got an integral over x, y, and z, uh, which gives you L times L times L, which is the volume, right? So this equals V, and the Emax, the two Emaxes cancel, right? And I brought, I brought this Emax out. So in this, in this sort of very idealized mode, where you've either got electric field, which is the maximum or zero, you can see why this definition works for the mode volume, right? And, and we just apply it in other situations as well and hope that it works equally well. So, if that's, so, does that make sense? Great. Okay. So, if that's no volume, we can rearrange to get uh, the maximum electric field as a function of the mode volume, right? And you see why I want to do this. I wanted to, I've, talk, I've shown you how the electric cavity, how the electric field depends on the length. If I decrease the length, I increase the electric field. Um, but also, obviously, depends on the transverse dimensions of the mode, right? So I want to include that as well. All right. <laughs> so, uh, right. So I've got I've got this expression for the maximum electric field. Um, and I can now write the electric field inside the cavity um, in terms of the input electric field, right? We, we figured this out a couple of slides ago, so I can plug that in. And, and, and just plugging that in, I end up with the maximum electric field inside the cavity is just equal to QL on KV times the integral of, of mighty N squared. This is basically just the input power, right? The input power is that times the constant. So I can plug. I can replace this with input power, and what I get finally is that the maximum electric field inside the cavity, which is really what we care about, is equal to Q on KV, right? That's that, times, times this integral, which is Pn2 on epsilon naught C. And rearranging, I can get that in terms of the resonator enhancement, I get a Q on V, and the properties of the incident field. So obviously, if I crank up the power of the incident field, I can increase the, 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 the maximum electric field. That's clear. Sometimes I don't want to do that. But in quantum optics, I don't want one photon, for example. Um, but, but given a, a, a fixed input field, it's really this ratio of Q on B which is important uh, for defining how much electric field you get inside the cavity. So that's really an important result here. So if we look at if we look at applications and how they depend on that on, on Q and B, then in quantum optics, I'm going to talk about this a bit more. You have a critical atom. Uh, a couple of lectures from now, you have a critical atom number, which tells you how many atoms you need in inside of a cavity before you start saturating a single photon electric field. So this is like how many atom, atoms do you need to do single photon nonlinear optics? You've got a critical photon number, which is which is how many photons we need to saturate the atom inside the cavity, a single atom inside the cavity, so it's basically exactly the same idea but in reverse. And you can see that they depend on, depend on Q and V in different ways. Um, you can see along here, most things depend on both Q and V, with the exception of, of, of maybe the photonics application. Um, <coughs> right, so photonics, this is what I described before. If you only care about filtering, you really only depend on only care about the Q of the cavity, you don't care, you don't care about the length of uh, but in, in sensing, if you care about, about the ratio, you just care about the maximum electric field inside the cavity, the maximum intensity inside the cavity. In optics, you care about 
about v on q squared, or q squared on v. Uh, you want to have a q squared on v as large as possible. Um, because you want to have two photons and, and, and make it interact with the extra q factor. So here you really want to have a high q cavity. Um, Alright. Okay, so why would you care about Wisman Gallery Mode Cavity? Why wouldn't you just use a Fabry Pro Cavity? This is an example of pretty much the smallest Fabry Pro Cavity you can make. So there's two little mirrors here on substrates. The light goes in this one and this way. And you push those mirrors as close together as you can so that there's something like one node within the one node within the rest of it. <coughs> so <coughs> the problem, <coughs> excuse me. The problem with this is that the dielectric coatings that you use to make those mirrors limits the volume, right? So this is just an example, an example here, you've got this dielectric stack. Uh, in order to get reflection, you've got to have some sort of interference between uh, the fields reflected off the different parts of, of the stack. So you, your load volume is, is constrained, the small you get that is constrained by this. <coughs> the Q is limited because well, how well can you make a dielectric stack, right? How accurately can you really make the thickness of, of those layers, <clears throat> right? Um, and the other big issue is, how would you, okay, maybe you can make one of these, and so I, I worked in Jeff Kimball's group, we spent a lot of time developing this sort of cavity, and you'd spend years getting one of these systems working, and you talk about something like a quantum information network, where you want to have many of them. But the reality is it just, I mean, it's, maybe you could get two, but it's very, very, very hard. So you need to have some sort of system which, both for commercial applications and for, 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 for research, you want to have a system which is easy to produce and cheap and you can make many of them. So, so, so this is the idea of a Wisp Gallery Mode as a matter of fact, it's very true. Imagine I've got a cube. And I get some light in it somehow, then, then if, if the angle of incidence is shallow enough, then I get total to a reflection, right? And the light gets trapped in there. Uh, there's a question of how you get the light in. It turns out that's answered by these evanescent fields. It turns out every reflection you get here gives you a bit of an evanescent field on the outside of the cavity. And if you have another structure which has an evanescent field, such as a prism, now a prism's not the best choice, uh, but you can use a prism what can be used for a long time, uh, then you can, the, the overlap of those two events in the field allows you to do coupling. <clears throat> so, so the nice thing about this is, uh, is that you don't need coatings anymore, right? You, you do away with dielectric coatings. So no longer do you have to get these very, very precise thickness multiplier stacks. All you need is a smooth surface, right? And also, you get reflectivity over a very wide range of wavelengths, right? No longer are you fixed at one wavelength. You can do experiments or uh, applications with multiple different wavelengths without any problems at all. As long as, as long as, as, as you get, you know, as long as you get total total reflection for that wavelength, uh, it'll work. Um, <clears throat> again, if you don't have dielectric stacks, you don't have the constraint on the low volume that that provides. So so, so the volume is really limited just by just by that uh, that uh, total into reflection. As you make the volume smaller, this angle not in this case, I guess, but the angle gets steeper uh, in, in a Wisman Gallery type in a, in a well, spherical cavity, which is the sort of cavity you normally use. Uh, and, and so you're limited by that sort of fundamental effect rather than technical effects. Uh, as long as you can fabricate the cavity. So fabrication is, is, is an issue. <clears throat> okay, the other nice thing is, is you can couple, this coupling, this evanescent field coupling, if I push the prism closer to the cube, then the coupling rate increases, right? So I'm no longer fixed at a certain coupling rate depending on how well I fabricated my mirrors. And I tell you what, when you're fabricating fabric pro cavity mirrors, um, you, you get what you get, right? You fabricate it and then you just work with it. As long as it's high Q, that's all you care about. You don't really care too much about how well the heat's matched it is. Here, I can control the reflectivity. 
If I repeat this carefully, or I could go and say, I could overcouple it or undercouple it, or do whatever I want. I could probably even do it in real time in the experiment. Um, <clears throat> right. So, okay, so the most well known, I guess, form of the gallon mode cavity is a microsphere. Alright, so it's the same thing, it's just spherical. Uh, here's a picture of one from the hologram of Caltech. Uh, basically, you make it by just taking a bit of fiber and melting it in I don't know, a hydrogen torch or something like this. The end bubbles, surface tension. Tension makes a very nice bubble. Surface tension is really your friend with Wishman Gallery motor cavities because it makes sure that you can atomic scale surface finish. You, you don't have surface roughness issues. You can couple into this with optical fiber. You can kind of see that in the background here, a couple of wide in and out. This sphere must be quite small, I get. Oh, I'm not sure, I have to check, but normally you wouldn't see any light around this perimeter. The way you get that is by making the surface really rough, so you get scattering or uh, they're making the system very small, so they can't really confine light very well, so you, get, so you see something. Um, <clears throat> right, so the nice thing about these cavities is you get very high Q, so 10 feet 8 or so, and I'll compare that to other systems in a couple of slides, and you can get very small diameters, so about 20 microns is probably, probably the typical limit that you can get to. Problems, so there are a few problems. One is it's, it's hard to systematically fabricate, right? You're melting the fiber, you can't produce, well, it's difficult to, to produce a lot of identical microspheres. It's, that also makes it difficult to integrate them with other optical systems. And the other, the other thing, the other problem, at least for quantum experiments, is, is that there are many frequency degenerate modes. So if you imagine a sphere, you're trying to couple them to this mode. There's also a mode like this, which has exactly the same frequency, in principle. A mode like that, and a mode like this, and around the direction you can think of. So if I've got an atom and I want it to spontaneously into, into my mode, well, why is it going to do that? It's got plenty of modes to choose from. Right, that's a problem. Okay, so, so an alternative system is a microdisc. So here, this is just fabricated with lithography. <laughs> um, fabrication is basically that you take a, you, you take a silicon chip, you, you heat it, you put it in, a, in some sort of thermal oven, to make, make it oxidize, you get a thin oxide layer, silica, and then, uh, and then you do photolithography on that to make a disc on the top. So you, so you remove most of the silica except for a disc, put that in, in some etch which etches silicon. Typically we use xenon difluoride because it turns out that this is um, uh, uh, very low in contaminants, so you get high Q. And that etches the silicon away isotropically leaving this, this disk, and light can, can resonate around on the perimeter here. Right? So that gets rid of the problem with having modes going all sorts of directions, and also means you can fabricate these things reproducibly on a chip, on a chip, and in principle, a couple of them available with waveguides. People do that. The um, problem with this is, as you can kind of see in this picture, if the light is confined around the rim of this disk, it's pretty rough. Right? Now that roughness introduces, it's, it's surface scattering essentially, right? So you get light scattering uh, away from the disk and, and you've got losses and that limits the Q to around, and people have got 10 to 6 or so, right? Um, but generally much larger than that. So, so uh, a development in 2003 from the Mahala group, which was uh, really significant, was to hit these disks with a CO2 laser and make them melt. When you do that, this is a picture of one from our lab. When you do that, the surface reflows, right? Just around the surface, and you get this, you get this donut. So it's like the micro disc, the micro torque, the micro sphere. You've used, uh, you've used um, <coughs> surface tension to make the surface very smooth, but but on a chip, and 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 without modes going around this way. And the result is you get. You get cues which are comparable to microspheres, 5 by 10 PA, less than 1 million. Um, this is just an example of, of Q. This is, this is a, a good way to measure the Q in one of these cavities. You put light in it and you ask, well, how long does it take for the light to leak out? That gives you tau. You know the frequency of the light very well. So you can figure out what the Q is. 
So this is the fabrication step. So I've already mentioned this. So we have a wet etch to make to make silica discs on a pads on a silicon uh, substrate. We use zero mofluorin etch. Zero obviously doesn't react with much, so you don't have to worry about it contaminating uh, your system and creating absorption alone in the cube. The fluoride etches etches the silicon, and then you hit it with a surgeon and a reply before it. Um, so, so I'm going to talk most of these four lectures about microfluorides because it's what I work with primarily in my lab. Uh, and also, you'll, you'll see that they have very desirable properties. <coughs> Excuse me. So, one other nice thing about toroids is that this is, so this is a fat toroid, right? You imagine you've got a big minor diamond on this donut on this, on this uh, toroid. This is this mode, this is the mode shape that sort of sits in here. It's roughly the same as the mode of a microsphere. But if I tighten that up and make and make the minor diamond small, I can squeeze the optical mode vertically, which means I get a smaller mode volume than you can in the sphere. Now the other nice thing, you know this with spheres as well, is, is by using an optical fiber, you can get far better coupling than you can with a prism. So the idea is that you take off the fiber, you heat it, and you pull it down. You pull it down to a very narrow width. And at the narrow point, there's an MS field that comes out, which can then couple to your system. Right? Now, the beauty of this is, is that you've got one waveguide mode, and you've got one cavity mode. The light doesn't have any choice where else, it, it doesn't have any choice of anywhere else to go, right? It can either be in one of those modes or the other. In a free space optical cavity, right? If you're coupled right into it, it, it can choose to either go into the cavity or go into some free space mode. And if your alignment isn't perfect, it's going to choose to go into the free space modes, right? So here, alignment is just not an issue. So what you find is as you bring the taper close to the toroid, there's always a point where you can get 100 percent coupling of the light into the cavity. Right? So this is this is a, uh, some experimental results from our lab. This is, this is coming closer into the cavity. Um, here we're undercoupled, so we, the coupled rate into the cavity is small compared to the loss rates of the cavity. Bring, bring the, the uh, taper in, the light, the light intensity that we see going past the cavity goes down until eventually all the light's going into the cavity. And then if I bring it even further overcoupled, essentially the light's just doing that, right? So it all goes through the fiber again. This is the backwards propagating field. If I look at the light coming back out the other direction from the fiber, then I see a peak. And I'll discuss a bit why you see that uh, next lecture, I guess. OK. So two other types of resonators I wanted to briefly talk about. One is, one is this uh, called a bottle micro resonator. Right? It's, a, it's just a, it's like a tape. It's a tape and optical fiber, just like I talked about before. But they make a little bulge in the middle of it. That's the little bulge. It turns out that if you model this, it's really elegant. You end up with the, mo the, the, the modes inside this resonator just look exactly the same as, as the modes of a, of a, a modern track. Um, <clears throat> compared to a toroid, these things look worse, right? The reason they look worse is, is that the Q is about the same, it's, they're made out of silica. And the same sort of losses. Um, but the mode volume is larger because the light sort of travels around like this and then back around like this. So one cycle, one cavity length is that rather than just that, right? The big, big, big advantage they have is that you can tune the resonance frequencies. So it turns out that if you pull the ends of the fiber, that stresses the structure and changes that track a bit, right? And that changes, changes the optical path. A lot. In a toroid, this is very, or any other from going on cavity, this is very difficult to do. One of the biggest technical problems with these cavities is trying to get a resonance where you want it. Right? You can heat them, and in our case, if we heat a toroid, we can maybe shift the resonance by about a tenth of a free spectral range. You need one free spectral range if you want to get a resonance anywhere you want it. Um, so that's a big advantage. 
this is this is uh, just some results. So, so you stress the fiber, and these are two different modes: one for each range of heart. And you see that you can tune one one mode direct all the way into the other. The other type of cavity that I thought that is really worth mentioning are these polished disc crystal discs, right? So this is just polished on a lathe. You, lay, you get a bit of crystal and you polish it. The, the, these things were pioneered by the guys at JPL. Uh, the problem is with a lathe, you can't really get very small cavities. But the huge advantage is you can choose what type of material you use, right? So you choose the crystal, so you can choose calcium fluoride to get very, very low losses. That's what they, they chose to get a curve above 5 by 10 to 10. So it's towards the amount higher than any other system, any other small cavity. Or you could choose with your live if you want maybe possible linearity screwed up. So, so I mentioned this even though it's not really a micro cavity because, you know, because the Q is so high. So if we, if we, if we sort of look at the zoo, zoo of optical cavities then, these are with gallery mode cavities. These are other types of cavities. If we compare you know, the best fabric grow cavity around to a Wisman gallery mode cavity, the Q is a factor of maybe 10, 50 worse. The volume is a factor of maybe five worse. Well, the the toroid, uh, much more than that, 20 or something like that. Um, so really these cavities, in terms of the critical parameters, are not as good as which from gallery mode cavities. If you look at a photonic crystal cavity, the big advantage you have is you can make the mode volume very small. That Q is out of date. You can now get Qs of 10. Uh, into the six. Um, but, yeah, uh, but the Q is worse. So, you know, horses are horses. Now, if I look at these other two contenders, uh, as I said, the bottle cavity really doesn't, doesn't uh, stack up against these two cavities because the bow volume is larger, except for the fact you can tune the resonances. And the, the uh, crystal micro cavity, well, it's got a very large mode volume, right? Um, but it's from the IQ, so depending on what you want to do. So this is just coming back to this application I mentioned. If I calculate, right, this is this is the, the fibers from the cavities, Q V, Q on V, and Q squared on V. So this is nonlinear optics, this is quantum optics and sensing, um, and this is sort of photonics. Then, then for photonics, I think you want to choose these these crystal micro cavities, and then maybe one of these uh, uh, reflow with Stringelli mode cavities. For, for quantum optics and sensing, you want to choose a toroid. It's, it's uh, well, better than every other system except for the micro discs by, by a, a considerable factor, but the micro discs by a factor of about three. Micro toroids, sorry. Micro spheres by a factor of about three. Um, and for nonlinear optics, well, if you look at this, then, then by an order of magnitude, the best type of cavity is the is these crystal micro cavities, and that's because the Q is so high and that compensates for high volume. Uh, but the next, the next runner up is the toroid at 3 by 10 15, so one order of magnitude behind. <coughs> now, uh, you know, that's a problem, but, but you can fabricate these cavities on the chip and fabricate, fabricate many of them, so many applications are probably better. Okay, so I'm probably over time, right? But, it started late, so I'll excuse myself. So if we look at the limits on the Q of these sorts of cavities, then uh, there's bulk material absorption, which is what I talked about before. The surface scattering, if the surface is rough, then that roughness means you don't get total thermal reflection, right? Some of the life will leak out. Um, there's, it turns out ab absorption in model layers or imperfections, you know, things coating the surface is a big problem. Uh, and then you've got radiated losses, bending losses. If you take a fiber and bend it too sharply, you start to lose light. Same thing happens in one of these cavities. And the total Q is just, well, the inverse of the total Q is the inverse of the sum of all these effects. Um, yeah, there's a couple of losses as well, obviously, if I couple them, you can go out. But that's it's, uh, not really a technical infection. So I'm just plotting a few of these to give you an idea. So this is the fundamental absorption of the silica. Uh, it really plunges off a cliff, or, well, okay, you get large absorption around, oh, 
saying it. So, sorry, it plunges off a cliff when you get low frequencies. Around 1550, we know that the Q is really high. So, in principle, you could get Qs of 10 to the above 10 to the 11 if you had, if you got rid of everything except for absorption in silica uh, at, at, at telecom wavelengths. Uh, and even at, at visible wavelengths, you're limited to about 10 to the 10. And so, we're not, we're not anywhere near the absorption limit. Uh, of these cavities for any, any system really, except maybe the, the uh, polished crystal cavities. If you look at the radius of the limit, and this is a love log graph, a log, sorry, a log linear graph, as I push the sphere radius down, obviously the radius of Q goes down, but if I plot, if I plot, if I combine them, what you see is this is the this is the radius of Q limit. This is our bulk limit including the other the other imperfections. What you see is that what, what the radiative factor does is it really just defines a threshold. It says, you know, you can operate the spheres up to a radius of about, in this case, about 8, eight micron. Don't go any further lower than that because your Q's just going to fall off a cliff. Um, <clears throat> so so that's, that's just imposing a limit on the mobile somehow. All right. So if we look at the volume, then you can calculate the volume. Um, you can calculate the volume of, of these uh, of Wissmiotti modes by solving the Helmholtz equation. Uh, I decided I wouldn't go into the details of that. For, for a microsphere, there's an eligible solution, which is very nice. It's device scattering. Uh, for other geometries, you need, you need numerical methods. There's two types of modes, TE modes and TM modes, transverse electric, transverse, transverse magnetic. There's three mode numbers for the three dimensions, as you add an extra number, you add an extra node to the modes. So this is, what is this? This is changing in, changing the radial mode number. All right, so this is the surface of the toroid, it's, and the light cycling around like this. Then as, as I add in, I add one extra node. Now here is the evanescent field, which is what you're interested in if you're doing something like sensing. You want to stick a part of the barrel on objects, you want to stick part of it there. You can calculate the mode volume from these shapes. This is just this is just uh, changing the other two mode numbers to get some effects. Um, so the only other thing was the limitation of the mode volume. It turns out that as you make the toroid smaller, the mode volume starts on the 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 Wissmann mode cavity smaller, the mode volume starts to get worse too, because eventually when you can't confine the light anymore, it's starting to bleed out of the cavity. Right? And that happens about the same time as you get range of losses. So so really uh, the ideal place to work is just before you start to see radiative losses in the Wissmann-Gallagher So, to summarize, uh, there's a lot of applications of these Wissmann mode, gallery mode sensors or, or cavities. Q and V are the two parameters that tell you somehow the goodness of these cavities. Microtorids have the best ratio of Q, Q and V of any Wissmann gallery mode system today. And you can couple them uh, to fiber and, and, and fabricate them with a chip, which is really very nice. Uh, <clears throat> the Q is at the moment limited, I think, by, by, by imperfections, actually, in, in, so by some contaminations in our fabrication process. It's a bit of a black art, we're not sure how to get, get, get rid of this at the moment. And the V is limited by major losses.